G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Kater McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host Connor Rogers. Rog, how are you mate? Yeah, never better Dossie. We're getting to the pointy end of the season now, aren't we? Just It seems like every week there are new stories bobbing up and uh, new storylines to follow and um, it's getting harder and harder to tell as we go on exactly how the top eight will finish up. Usually when you when you get to this point in the season, it becomes clearer exactly how the top eight is going to finish up. But if anything, the, the vision is getting a bit more blurry. So it's exciting times. I can't wait. Yeah, from the top eight to the top four to the bottom four, it is on for young and old. It's one of the most exciting seasons we've ever seen. Uh, we'll fire things off with the headline, Rog, if you want to kick us off the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm actually studying uh, satire, a bit of comedy news <laughs> Batuta advocate style at university at the moment. So this fits right in. Just a bit of homework. Gee, thanks, guys. Quote, Shannon Hearn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, oh. they didn't really uh, turn up for the great man. I think it's, Golly, golly. I think it's the first West Coast Eagles player to hit 300 games. Bottom four yeah. side. They're a top eight side. What was that performance? Was he a premiership captain? Is he a premiership captain? Yeah, he is. Yep. It, this bloke is just as big a legend of the club as you could possibly hope to have. Yep. And they flat out have not rocked up. Now, when uh, Cade Simpson um, had his retirement match, or maybe it was his uh, 300th or something like that, the record-breaking match, whatever his last milestone was, uh, Carlton didn't rock up. And it was the first time David Teague ever gave him a spray. I don't know if you remember the footage, but in the rooms at halftime, yep. Teague, for the first time ever, showed emotion. He went berserk. And that was frustrating. I thought, how could they not rock up for Cade Simpson's big game? But we were a bottom four side going up against a decent side. So... Yeah, it does make a bit of sense that we'd be no good. I don't understand how, for Shannon Hearn, 350th, you're a top eight side, you're playing Collingwood, who are out of the bottom four by percentage, and you can get absolutely belted. It's not even like <laughs> you, you, you just happen to lose by a couple of kicks in a close game. They got creamed, and I don't know if you've seen the on-the-couch footage, uh, but they, they relayed some of the some of the behind the goals vision of players like Elliot Yo, their senior players who were just having a jog around. They didn't want to chase. And mm. we flagged this ages ago, Dossie, that West Coast just are not up for the fight away for the home and are pretenders, and this has proven it more than ever. Yeah, we mentioned it very early in the season that they just had a consistent run of a, a body of work that suggested they weren't going to rock up every week. I think On the Couch, which is a great show, which we love, I think they said uh, they pick their their turn. They pick their turn when they want to rock up and when they want to play. I feel like West Coast, when they flick the switch, still have those players on the ground that can topple a top four side, but often enough, they're just not rocking up and they're getting really, really belted, like r- bad beltings, like really poor performances. And... I just I, I I wasn't ex- not expecting this sort of result against the Pies. I felt like potentially they were building a little bit. They got over the line against the Crows, a little bit unconvincing against the Saints at home. But I just felt like two wins under their belt. Here they go. It's that time of year where a professional outfit starts to turn up, and yeah, to come out and perform like that was really disappointing. I think Robert Harvey is putting together a nice little run of form. How have you seen his coaching since he's taken over? <sighs> Yeah, of course, the flip side of the coin is that the Pies were absolutely magnificent. They're playing a bunch of kids. We love Trent Bianco. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a big trap there, caretaker coach, isn't it? We've seen yes. in the in the past few years, uh, I think what happens is the caretaker comes in and the playing group feels so guilty that their coach, who undoubtedly I'm sure a lot of them liked, um, has lost their job, been publicly embarrassed. You know, you are embarrassed, no doubt, when the whole footy community is coming out saying, oh, Buckley needs to get sacked, he needs to get the flick. Um, and then he goes and you feel personally responsible. So when the new coach comes in, I reckon you have a bit of a point to prove. You feel a bit horrible in yourself and you come out and you 
and you try even harder. So I think it can be a bit of a trap. But in saying that, uh, they are playing very exciting football. You know, when Buckley was all about possession footy, chip it around, take your time, uh, seems like they're more willing to pull the trigger and go up the guts and handball and run and carry. And uh, it's working for them. They've won some games. So... Um, I'm not prepared to say Robert Harvey is the man for the job, but he <laughs> certainly hasn't done his uh, coaching coaching uh, reputation any harm whatsoever. And just quietly, um, I've watched a couple of games and been really, really impressed with Jordan Degoe, and I'm pretty sure he's sort of post by form has been as good as any other midfield forward in the comp. He's been exceptional, and I just wonder if this is that uh, Josh Dunkley back end of the season before he has a great season, that sort of back half of a year which sets him up for next year I wonder if Jordan Degoe can fulfill his potential next year off the back of the form that he's bringing this season yeah well there's a few players like that the big x-factor players who have uh, been susceptible to having inconsistent seasons they look like they're going to be the next Dustin Martin then they fall away like Jake Stringer has just had Mm. one of the all just looks like he could win the game off his own boot at any moment. And Jordan Gulley is much the same, playing a lot more midfield time, and maybe that's just where he needed to be. I don't know if he's worked on his tank or what's happened. But, yeah, it is promising signs uh, for Collingwood. But, unfortunately, for West Coast, they're, they're not looking too promising. And the, the, uh, the other little uh, issue with the West Coast is their future isn't looking exceptionally bright. Their, under, their list of under-23 players, mm. I don't think it's anywhere near as exciting as when you compare it to other teams like in, you know, in North Melbourne that's at the bottom of the ladder. When you compare it to their under-23 list and so many others, um, there's not a whole lot to get excited about, wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, w- I, I, wouldn't, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too excited either. And it's, it's, they're at that tipping point and it sort of reminds me of Collingwood last year where they've got – a lot of over 30s, a lot in that older age bracket. And their young players, I think we did see that list that was sort of bandied around. Uh, and the the big notable name of the under 23s was Oscar Allen. But his yeah. sort of last half of the season has been very inconsistent. He, uh, It's sort of a bit of a meme in the... Um, in the AFL betting community and the super coach community when Oscar Allen gets named in the forward line, but plays back line and yep. to throw someone like him around and he gets put into the ruck and thrown into the back line and, and whatnot. It, it's very, very confusing when you just feel like his first six rounds and his start to the season, if he had played forward all year, I think we would still be talking about him as the next big key forward, but he's sort of uh, fallen off a little bit this season just through being yeah, plugging holes for the team. So they they have a little bit to work with. I'd like to see them get to the draft um, because I like he- when, like what Port Adelaide did, that one draft where they brought in three fresh talent that can play straight away in your 22, can refreshen your side or freshen up your side straight away. It doesn't take two or three years. doesn't take a rebuild. So I'd like to see if they could get to the draft just to freshen up the squad for next season. Yeah, and even if it's not an instant Port Adelaide, you know, it's rare where, we, where you draft three players and they're ready-made, they come in and start. But even if you do, you know, I'll go back to 2015, Carlton. Um, we drafted, in the same draft, Weedering, Mackay, Kerno, Cunningham, who the Carlton faithful will tell you they have uh, a lot of belief in, and Jack Silvani. And, you know, a player like Jack Silvani has only taken until this season to really show that he's going to be a legitimately good and exceptional AFL footballer. But that's what happens when you go to the draft. You know, you how many picks did they trade away for Tim Kelly? Was it three first-round picks or two? Uh, I reckon it was... Two, maybe an early second, but it was like, yeah, it was something very, very yeah. heavy, which the Cats turned into Jeremy Cameron. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I mean. You know, you're trading away, and they it's not the first time they've traded away first-round draft picks, I don't think. So it is a bit of a worry when you do that sort of stuff because you're sacrificing the potential to get your Rosies and your Dursmers and your Kurnos and your Mackays through the door. Um, and you have to question, you know, some of these older blokes, especially the ones that... Um, played in the West Coast Grand Final, are they as hungry for another Grand Final win as, you know, a couple of 22-year-olds with a point to prove are? I'm not sure. But we will move on from uh, the West Coast Eagles. Uh, Hopefully they do lift for their supporters because I reckon they deserve a bit more. But uh, they are right on the fringe of dropping out of the eight now. They 
Uh, I think are only a game in and they have Brisbane and Melbourne to come. So there's every chance they lose those two games and whether it be uh, uh, Frio, Giants, Carlton, Essen and St Kilda, Richmond win their last two or three, West Coast could find themselves slipping out. But the question is there to ask, who the bloody hell wants to take eight <laughs> spot on the ladder, McDonald? Who wants it? It's just there. Someone just play three weeks of good footy and take your prize. <laughs> yeah, it is absolutely up for the gra- uh, up for grabs. It's as big an opportunity as you can get to make the top eight. I don't think a team has made the top eight with this least amount of wins in a long 11 time. Eleven wins. Yeah, usually I, it's just twelve wins gets you in, but eleven's going to do it this year. And that just speaks to the evenness of the competition. Yeah, it's insane. I think I've changed my answer every week. I remember when Freo popped in a couple of weeks ago. I thought, geez, the Freo Dockers are playing great footy, and then all of a sudden the Tigers were there again, and I thought, yeah, that makes sense. Tigers are home, and then all of a sudden the Giants were in, and I thought, geez, the Giants look like they could go all the way, but it just keeps changing. You've devised a little bit of a uh, Steve Bradbury plan for the Blues. There is a little bit of a highway of how the Blues could make it. After the year they've had, it would just be unbelievable. But um, what's it looking like for the Blues to to pounce into the eight? Well, for starters, I'm pretty certain, barring uh, absolute turmoil from all the other teams, we would need to win our last three games to make the eight. <laughs> um, and that in that does sound extremely unlikely because when was the last time we won four in a row, in a row? Considering we won last week, yep. but I'm going to be the optimist for a second. If we beat Gold Coast. This week, which you imagine we should. Tick. That's yeah. that's the bookies' favourite. If Geelong beats the Giants, that's the bookies' favourites. Uh, if <laughs> <laughs> if uh, what else have we got here? If the Dogs beat Essendon, the bookies' favourites. Yep. Uh, if if Brisbane beat Freo, the bookies' favourites. <laughs> then uh, and Richmond beat North Melbourne, which which. <laughs> Which will happen, but that's not the result we want. We want North Melbourne to beat Richmond. But if all of those happen, then we're eighth if Richmond lose to North. But if Richmond beat North, then we're ninth on percentage. And then we've got only two games to go. And, you know, if we beat Gold Coast, right, Mm. and then we go to the big Port Adelaide game. And now Port Adelaide aren't the cream of the crop. They are beatable. (laughs) If we beat Port Adelaide, then all of a sudden our la- the, the last game is the Giants and that could be a spot in the eight. So I'm not saying we're going to make it. It's extremely unlikely. We'd have to win our last three. But teague has got a big point to prove. And all I'm saying is that it's wide open. And mm. what I do think is that I don't I don't think what we're looking at now, West Coast 7th, 308th, I don't think that's how it's going to finish up. And... All it takes is for one team, whether it be Giants, whether it be Essendon, whether it be Richmond, whether it be Carlton, all it takes is for one of those teams to have a good three weeks. And I know it looks unlikely when you look at Carlton and you go, oh, gee, they need to win their last three. But one of those teams win their last three and they're in the eight or they're into seventh spot. So I don't know who it's going to be, but even if St Kilda could come up, shock the world, win their last three and make the eight, who knows? So it's exciting times and I think we will get a big surprise and someone... Probably a little bit unexpected will sneak into eighth or maybe even seventh if West Coast do end up dropping out. But there were so many games over the weekend that um, affected that uh, eighth spot. And the first we'll talk about is Freo and the Tigers. Unfortunately, I was at uh, my mate's birthday dinner at Mexicano on Brunswick Street. So I missed it. <laughs> I miss this game, but you were watching it uh, close eyed. Tell, tell me, tell me a bit about the proceedings of that close contest. Oh man, they should stack. Sunday afternoon games every round. It was just unbelievable. I sat in front of my TV from 12 till about 9 o'clock at night. Uh, They had a couple of games overlap, so I got the KO split screen going. It was just (laughs) so, so good. And the games were very, very good. We'll touch on a couple of the games, uh, a couple of the other games in uh, in a sec. But yeah, Freo and the Tigers, unbelievable. It was sort of wet, cold conditions over at Optus and... Freo were controlling the contest for most of the game. The Tigers, in typical Richmond fashion, worked their way in front. And they, they sort of got in front by three points into going, geez, it's still on for young and old. And then Jack Rewalt kicks a goal from 45. And you're going, well, hang on. This is the Tigers. Yeah. They're, they're done. It, it, it's a gallant effort from Freo, typical. But it's the Tigers at the end of the day. All of a sudden, the, uh, the Dockers, they dig really deep. Um, Brayshaw was unbelievable. Chera was massive. And even when I was watching, I was, I was seeing when Mundy got the ball, 
how important his disposal was. Like some of the younger blokes were a panicking through that last little patch in the final quarter. But when David Mundy got it, whether it was a handball or a kick, it was a great decision that set their play up. Anyway, the ball goes long. Lockie Schultz flies for it, takes a great mark, kicks the goal, gets it back to three points. And then a couple of minutes later, Caleb Sarong kicks the sealer. It was unbelievable. It was the and the crowd at Optus. Like I, I'd been watching games with the fake crowd noise all weekend, so to hear the crowd roar, a home a home crowd as well. Um, it was an unbelievable contest, and it saw Freo hop back up in the top eight contentions, and it probably leaves the Tigers on an absolute knife edge. Yeah, well, we uh, we know that Fremantle are in eighth spot now, and would you suggest that if they keep playing footy like that? They'll be the team that makes the eight. And do you think they are capable of playing that for the last uh, three rounds? Considering uh, on their agenda, they've got St Kilda. They have, I'm just going through the fixture here, the that. Eagles. The, they have the Eagles, the big derby. Wow. And then, yep. And then they've got, uh, uh, who have they got this week? Sorry, this week they've got Brisbane. So it goes Brisbane, St Kilda, Eagles. Uh, no, I don't think Freo will be the team. I have loved some of their performances this year and I think they are going to be a great team in the future. I really like uh, Justin Longmire or yep. Long, Longmuir. Yep. Oh, J- JL. Longmuir. Big J- yeah, JL. Big, big JL, man. Um, the way he speaks in the media and conducts himself, I've said this for a couple of years, I'm, I'm a massive fan. So I do see their future being bright, especially with that young crop, the Hayden Youngs, the Liam Henrys, Sarong. I could go on. Um, but Gee, J- 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 JL and Hayden, it sounds like the opening <laughs> opening partnership of the Australian <laughs> National Cricket Team circa 2004. Can they just draw? Can they just draft assignments? That would just be yeah. unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, I am very optimistic about the Dockers going forward, but this year I can't see them being consistent enough to close it out. So, If I, they yeah. do want to – sorry to cut you off. There if you they do want to be this successful team that lifts their uh, debut Premiership Cup, the inaugural Premiership Cup down at Fremantle Land, uh, you would think they need to keep the trio of Brayshaw, Chera and Sarong together. Like, we mm. know that uh, Premiership sides, you need three gun midfielders. Two generally don't do it enough. We know Brayshaw's a superstar and we're pretty confident Sarong will be. Adam Chera will be as well. He's already a gun. But all the rage that he's leaving is coming home to Victoria. I think Collingwood, Richmond and Carlton, I think, are the three teams really chasing him hard and reckon they can get him. Uh, and on the couch, Jared did a little a little call to arms, a little plea to Brayshaw, uh, sorry, Chera, asking him to stay, just saying, mate, you know, why would you want to leave this? You have a, the, there's a promising future over there at Fremantle. And it would be frustrating as a Fremantle supporter you're still waiting on that first premiership so you do a little rebuild you get these gun players in and it looks like you've got that midfield for the next 15 years and then one of the key pieces of the puzzle decides he wants to ship his way over back to victoria uh i hope he does come to the baggers i'd love to see it from my perspective but where, where do you stand on sort of player loyalty to the club and also the desire to go home um Really, it's a really tough decision. I'm pretty sure Adam Chera, when he was getting drafted, was one of the sort of draftees in the last couple of years that put his hand up and was pretty reluctant to go interstate. And I think he got talked around probably by his manager or, or you know, people close to him that, you know, this is a great experience, this is a great opportunity for you. But he he, he was one of those players where there was a lot of talks that he was really reluctant to go into state. So the go-home factor for him has always been massive. And whether you take the punt on an Adam Chera and draft him and try and convince him to stay, you, that's sort of at your own risk. Like, I know other clubs, I think, sort of were reluctant to get Bailey Smith because he had a similar mindset. He wanted to stay in Melbourne, Archie Perkins as well. Um, so... They've sort of drafted him knowing that he does have that go-home factor uh, in him. And now it's their job to make him, you know, to try and convince him to stay. And I think they've done a great job. I think the culture and I've seen like videos of their facilities over in WA, they are in a good position as a football club. And I think they're on the precipice of something special. So it's at his own risk. It, it, like if he's trying to come back to go to a team in a better position... <laughs> Maybe the Tigers or, you know, maybe there are teams in Melbourne that are, but 
Freo are in a great position, I think, for the future. So I'd be very cautious about coming home. It just depends on how much he, he's missing Victoria, really. Is he is he out of contract? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yep. I yep don't... Sign, yeah, obviously. I personally don't have an issue with when someone's contract is up, looking elsewhere. That's fine for me. I think in any workplace in the world, when you're out of contract, you can go find another job in the same field elsewhere. Um but where I do have an issue is if you're still in contract and you say, I want to go home and you just request a trade and you nominate a club. I yeah, think yeah, yeah. I think you have to accept that AFL, you know, it, it isn't just a job where it, it you don't get free range. Like part of the job is that you might have to work overseas for two years. It's the same as when someone goes and work on the bloody oil rigs out in Perth. Um, yep. You can't say, oh, I want to go work on the work on the oil rigs down, the mines or whatever down in Victoria because we don't have any. Um, it, mm-hmm. If you want to do that job, you have to accept that for the two years you're going to be doing it in Perth. And I think once you sign that contract to get drafted or whatever it may be, you go serve your time out there. It's not the worst case scenario. And then you can come back when your contract's up. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's going to be a bit of a watch because if they sign him, which we've seen before, I felt like Andrew Gaff was going to leave West Coast and he waited till the end of the season and then signed. I used to think, you know, growing up, Buddy Franklin, Tom Scully, once you heard the words, oh, I'll be waiting till the end of the season, Gary Ablett Jr., in that little period, it definitely meant that they were leaving. It doesn't quite mean that anymore. Um, Andrew Gaff's a great example of what, leaving his contract to the end of the season and then signing. So if they could sign him, that would be a massive, massive, yeah, a massive thing for their football club. And I think, um, I think, no, I've forgotten what I was going to say. I was well, gonna... even, even Tom Papley requested a trade to Carlton. They couldn't negotiate a deal, which was completely fair. And uh, he stayed at Sydney and he's fallen back in love with Sydney. So even if you are thinking of going back home, um, it is still possible that the player stays. So uh, fingers crossed, Fremantle fans, because if you can keep Chera, then uh, you've got one hell of a midfield going forward. Another game that affected not just the top eight, but the top four was a Port v Giants game where the Giants uh, slipped out of the eight and the Porter into the four. But they're one of the most unconvincing top four sides I've ever seen. Don't get me wrong, they're playing <laughs> they're playing decent footy, but I still feel like they're yet to take that big scalp of teams in front of them, but they are just doing the job with the teams below them. So do you, do you see a world where they make a grand final, Doss? Do you think that that's a possibility? They get the double chance and they just happen to beat a Melbourne or a Geelong or a Bulldogs come the time when it matters most and they get in there? Uh, no, I don't see that. I don't see that. I think there's levels to this season and I think I think the top three are very, very close. I think the top three, you're potentially splitting hairs. There probably is a bit of an order. You could probably go Geelong, Bulldogs, Melbourne, but I think between you know one and three, it's very, very close. I then think, for me personally, it's a Swans at four. And then there's a drop off from the t- from the top four. I think there's a massive drop off, and even I'm a massive fan of the Lions. And I think with their finals experience, anything could happen over the last uh, month for them. But they're not putting together performances either. So I do think a, a-, a Lions or Port Adelaide are so far off it that. I'm prepared to put a line through them for the flag, especially Port Adelaide. They limped over the line in a pretty grubby contest against the Pies. Um, They sort of had a hard-fought win against the Giants. I think the Giants on their day can push a lot of top sides, so it probably is a good win, especially away from home, I guess, as well. But it's just not convincing me enough to suggest that Port are a real threat. Your boy, uh, Carl Amon, he's your boy, isn't he? Yes, Yes. Yeah, he's, he's just casually racked up 31 touches in a goal. You called it from a mile away that every team needs a Carl Amon, and I thought you meant it as sort of a, a sort of a battler that does his job each week, but he's turned into quite the footballer, and also on an individual level at Port Adelaide. I don't know if you've checked the Brownlow odds, but uh, Bontempelli is a favourite at about 2 or $2.50. Yep. Then you have Ollie Wines at $4.50, which... Has surprised me. I obviously haven't watched enough Port Adelaide games. And then uh, is Sam Walsh at $7.50. Uh, sorry, Clary Oliver at uh, about 5 bucks after Ollie Wines. So yep. um, the race is wide open. And uh, I just didn't realise Ollie Wines has had that deadly of a season, but obviously he has. No, yeah. Ollie Wines clearly yeah, putting together a great string of form. I remember he sort of fell off the uh, the sort of 
eyes of the competition for a couple of years there. He, he came on really quickly as a junior and then for a couple of years he sort of went missing but he's come back in great form. Um, not to Cropa, another <laughs> Carlton reference, but I could see like a Paddy Cripps bouncing back from the runner form that he's at. Similarly to an Ollie Wines, I think it, you have to be a special player to be a gun your whole career and I think you see that players can go through patches and seasons and I think Ollie Wines is putting together as good of a season as he was putting together, if not better, um, when he first came on the scene. So credit to him. And yeah, just to touch on Carl Amon, he, he was. He was that player that was in the 22 every week contributing. Every touch he got was really, really good. But uh, if you weren't a Port fan, you're sort of going, who's this Carl Amon bloke? Who's this young bloke getting a game? And it was just quite funny how consistent he was for a long, long time. And now in a sort of Cam Guthrie <laughs> type <laughs> effort he's now turned into borderline elite <laughs> so it's a great story and um yes yeah, so i think everyone would love a carl amon <laughs> absolutely well i hope that this is another game that is impacting the eight i really really do because it's of course my boys the blue baggers up against st kilda friday night football god knows how that was picked as a friday night game <laughs> You just knew either one of them weren't going to turn up or both of them weren't going to turn up and it was going to be an absolute shit fight. Very bizarre fixturing. But luckily for us, it was St Kilda who didn't rock up and Carlton uh, got the job done. I assume you watched the game, McDonald. It was very, very pleasing viewing and refreshing viewing, viewing from a, for a Carlton supporter. Yes, I did watch the game. I wasn't really expecting... Uh yeah, the Blues to blow St Kilda out of the water like they did. It was so exciting early because I thought these teams were evenly matched and I do still uh, believe that. And to kick off the game with Maxi King kicking three, um, Harry Mackay down the other end kicking a couple and Charlie Kerno getting involved, I'm going, geez, oh, strap yourself in. This is going to be a real olden style battle of the key forwards. And in the end, the Blues were very professional about the performance. It was a win that I think Carlton fans would have expected to have at the start of the season. But after sort of an iffy few, you know, few weeks and a bit of a patch through the middle of the season, you start to question, do we have that consistent four-quarter professional performance in us? And, um, yeah, the way they played was unbelievable. And, yeah, Mac, like, one thing that I thought was really impressive with Jacob Wiedering, I thought after... I know he didn't get seven kicked on him, or maybe he did, but he had a direct opponent that he was playing on throughout the day, have a good day, in Nick Larkey the week before. And when you start the first five minutes of Maxi King's getting free kicks in the goal square and taking marks on you, he could have dropped his head, but he just dug in deeper. And I think after he kicked his third Max King, there was three more long balls to the top of Max King's head. And Jacob Wiedering marked every single one of them. And from there, it was a bit of a turning of the tide in the comp- uh, in the game. So fair play to the Blues, and it was a great win. Yeah, Wiedering will be the next captain of our football club. He oozes leadership, and that's what he does. He's very professional, and he just manages to get the job done each week, with the Nick Larky game being the one aberration on that record. But uh, the most promising aspect of the game for mine was... Tom DeConning goes down injured, and we are bereft of Ruckman. Mark Pittenet has gone down. Tom DeConning's gone down. We don't really have a backup. You can't throw Mackay in there. You don't want to risk it, and mm. uh, you certainly can't throw Charlie Curnow in there. You need Wiedering and Jones down back, so who else have we got? And they throw Jack Silvani in there like they have the last few weeks, and he ends up with something silly like 22 disposals, a goal, uh, half a dozen clearances and 10 tackles, and best on ground for mine. He got the 10 coaches' votes, or nine coaches' votes, I think, while she got seven. Um, so he had all of his knockers at the start of his career. He's only getting a game because of his name. But he has proven that um, he's not just going to be uh, a fringe player, but a key cog in our premiership tilt going forward if we are lucky enough to get there. And what else has become evident with Jack Silvani is that we thought he was going to be that third or fourth forward. You have Kerno, you have Mac- well, we thought initially Kerno running the show, Mackay second fiddle, but now that's flipped. Then you have McGovern running around, and Jack Silvani might pick up the fourth forward and he might be a flanker. But he just finds a pill in the midfield and he always does something with it and he lays tackles like no tomorrow. So. It's becoming clear we want him in the guts or around the guts, whether it be on a wing or in the midfield. So he's got a tank on him, and I just absolutely love what Jack Silvani is doing. 
Um, this this might be already established, but I think on Jack Silvani's footy card, it should have utility. It, it gives me Jack Watts vibes, the way he plays. Um, in terms of you could throw him anywhere, and I know that might sound like a little bit of a knock and probably selling Jack Silvani a little bit short, but Jack Watts, when he started playing good footy between 2014 and 2017 for the Ds, could be in the back line, he could ruck, he was in the midfield, he was on the wing, he was in the forward line. And I think Jack Sil- Silvani is very, very similar. And, um, yeah, yeah, I think players like that are important. And I know he was a big father-son name, but he doesn't have to be the Harry Mackay or the Charlie Curnow. So I think his role, Carl Amon-ish for the Blues, is very important. What is becoming interesting is since our external review has gotten underway, we have won four from six games, including one absolutely embarrassing loss to North Melbourne. If we had have won that, <laughs> we'd, be in the, we'd be in the eight right now. But uh, f- we won four out of six games, and say we win, let's just say we win, keep that sort of percentage going, and we win the next two out of three, uh, that would take it to six out of nine games. And it's interesting to see if an external review can be that scathing, can be... Uh, suggesting that he needs to move on from a record of six out of nine games. Because if you had had that record throughout the whole season, you're comfortably in finals. So Mm. um, we are curious there, but of course the Clarkson factor comes into it. I've got a question for you, Dossie. Yep. If, if, uh, let's say hypothetically, big hypothetical, we sneak into the eight. We win our last three games or, uh, and we manage to sneak in. We lose our first final, so that's the situation. He'd be the first coach to get us into finals for over eight years, I think. Mm. If Clarkson says, I want to come to Carlton, give me a million per year, it's done. Do you think it's possible to sack Teague after finishing eighth, or let's say even if he finishes ninth uh, with a big finish to the season? Um, do you think it's possible to sack him and just bring Clarko in? Do you think that's the right thing to do? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think it's I, the right thing to do as, yeah. as well. I feel like this season... There's, you know, the Saints have had a pretty average year and they could still make the eight. The Bombers, well, they've been pretty good, actually. But there's teams who have had sort of uh, iffy years that could still make the eight. And I feel like that would paper over a few cracks. I think you've had the heartache of this year of sort of giving up, like that you've given up on the dream. Um, And I feel like if you make the eight... It might set unrealistic expectations for next year, even though you probably do make the eight next year. So I think it's almost better just to to not make it just in case it sort of papers over some cracks. Yeah, that's a good call. Oh, that's a good call. It probably would be better for the longevity of the club to get the four-time premiership coach, Alastair Clarkson, in. And speaking of the great man... Uh, he, he's proven again, once again, why <laughs> it is just absolutely <laughs> l- ludicrous. The worst decision I've ever seen to sack him. He's taken the 17th place Hawthorne to, over to the Lions. I mean, he's drawn with Melbourne. He's beaten the Lions uh, away from home. And they just decided that he can't coach. We'll get Sam Mitchell in. Can you make odds or ends of it, McDonald? They went up to Sydney, middle of the year, uh, and, and, and flogged Sydney. Um, they were very competitive against the Cats at the start of the year. What hasn't he done? He's done it all. Unbelievable. Uh, I remember saying, yeah, it's a great decision. Probably three or four weeks ago we had the chat, um, or maybe two or three, maybe two weeks ago, two or three weeks ago when it got decided. Um, I remember saying, yeah, I think it's great. I think, you know, they've been down the bottom. That fresh air, that new coach, that new feeling gives the the buzz around the club a, a bit of a lift, a bit of a freshen up. And you said... They've just sacked a four-time premiership coach. Like, that is insane. Like, wait till he really, you know, bottoms out the club and they, you know, they haven't made finals for years. But when, when we're seeing positive signs, uh, even though the list needs a bit of a jig, their game plan is still quite positive. It, it's insane to get rid of uh, Clarko as a coach. I felt I, – I, I didn't necessarily agree with that, but the draw against the Ds I thought was crazy. I couldn't believe how well that – undermanned Box Hill side played. They had that many players out, it was ridiculous. So I, yeah, did open my eyes when the Ds couldn't get over the line to them. And then everyone sort of said that that was a maligned performance by the Ds when I felt like, geez, I felt like the Hawks really stepped up against us. And they've done it again against Brisbane Lions who were fighting for a top four spot. And I think it's, it's... He's going out with a bang. He's not going out and just playing the youth and just sort of giving up. He's going out taking scalps, I feel like they're a little bit of a dangerous side to come up against in these last three rounds. But, yeah, it is making – well, it's. 
I can't believe how poorly they've gotten rid of him as well. Like, they, they, it was just so poorly handled. It got leaked early on Thursday or Friday morning, and then he had to rock up. They had two posters in the background. It wasn't that traditional big press conference at an MCG function room uh, where they come out and celebrate him. It was just, he was in the cold, standing there with his shorts on with Sam Mitchell. It was just awkward. It was, it's, it's so- been so awkward. Like, for a bloke who's won them four premierships, quite possibly the greatest coach of all time, it should have been the biggest celebration of all time. You know, let him say he had his contract, and then at the end of it, if you don't want to continue, you know, you come out and say we've chosen not to continue his contract because that isn't a sacking. You know what I mean? That yeah. uh, it is. It is to a degree. I can understand why some people think it is. But if you sign a contract, you get to the end of the contract, and we go, okay, we're parting ways. It's not really that big of a sacking compared to cutting it a year short. That's a bit disrespectful, I think, for a man who's done so much for the club. But, oh yeah, I'm envisioning um, if they did it the right way, it's his last game in front of a big crowd at the MCG. He walks out holding his kids. The whole Hawthorne supporters are getting a bit emotional and it's, you know, just this grand, beautiful thing and we all celebrate the end of Clarko's reign at Hawthorne. All good things must come to an end. But this has come across as just a big old slap to the face. No one's happy about it. The supporters aren't happy. There's rifts inside the club. The players weren't happy. I just can't fathom how they could cock something something up so badly. But uh, the flip side of that uh, that coin for that game is the Brisbane Lions. Wow. It's become evident they are not making the four. And are you happy to slap the big old pretender label on them? Or do you think that it's possible they do uh, Western Bulldogs of 2016 and storm into premiers? I felt like their age profile and their finals experience over the last couple of years was perfect for them to launch this season. And through the middle of the season, I think they had 10 or 11 wins in a row or something silly. From round three to round 13, they were unbelievable. I was really, really worried about coming up against a Brisbane Lions outfit in finals. But now, I'd probably need another week to fully rule them out. But they are the shell of themselves. They are... Uh, what what is happening? What is happening? It's not like I, I suppose they do have a couple of key injuries, and every club does carry key injuries, and maybe they're a little bit immature to fully handle them. But this is a missed opportunity. I feel like the Lions. This it's the most even year ever. They have beaten the team that everyone thinks is going to win in the Cats and beaten them comfortably. If there was, And I felt like this year, I felt like last year was the same for them. They had the grand final at the Gabba. What an opportunity for a top two Brisbane Lions team to win a flag and they couldn't do it. And I feel like this year is sort of similar where it's like, it's a real opportunity for these young Lions. They've beaten a team comfortably that everyone thinks is going to win. This is an amazing chance for them. And they're letting it slip a little bit. So over the next couple of weeks, it's a real watch. If they fully drop off, I feel like this has just been a bit of a wasted season. Yeah, correct. And uh, the other team up at the Sunshine State that has also completely dropped off is the Gold Coast Suns, who got absolutely creamed by your boys, the Demons. (laughs) I can't believe it's taken us till the 40th minute of the show to get into them. But (laughs) the Ds absolutely embarrassed the Gold Coast. But there are a few little storylines to take out of the game, McDonald. Yeah, there was storylines galore. First of all, I'll just say I was very impressed with the victory. Um, We've talked before how the Demons are so defensive that we limp over the line. So uh, uh, we we can be dominant uh, across games, but only win by 10, 15, 20 points. This was the complete opposite. We opened up the opened the arms up, (laughs) stepped out with the, the left leg and just swung. And it was a really great four-quarter performance. It's something we needed. I feel like this could be the start of the Ds kicking into gear, but a bit of a disappointing act um, throughout the game. Jack Viney has put his elbow into Sam Collins's head. I felt like there was a little bit of an overreaction on social media. Fancy that. Um, <laughs> but I do... When you say a little bit of an overreaction, was it people trying to get the fish onto the hook, do you reckon? Or do you think it was legitimately no, people I, I going think, over it? I think the super slow mode video from Fox Footy, super slow mode of Jack Viney holding his elbow into... It's sort of like behind his ear, sort of his jaw... Um, Looked horrific, looked absolutely disgraceful, and it's not an act on the footy field I condone. So when I had a quick breeze through the Twitter comments, which is probably a dangerous place anyway, there was a lot of 
that's worse than Barry Hall. That's four to six. That that's eight weeks. Um, some people, yeah, comparing it to acts we've seen in America, and I just thought, golly gosh, like I, I feel like it. Yeah, it was a terrible act, and I certainly don't condone it. But when I saw a swinging elbow from Buddy, and I know it's different, but a swinging strike to the head, not copper weak, and we've seen acts from Joel Salwood, which is similar in terms of the players on the ground, and he is forearming them in the forehead. I thought, well, surely a pressed forearm elbow to the jaw isn't going to get a week. But I think the act and the way that that looked... I think it's certainly deserved of a couple. Um, yeah, I'd sit pretty comfortably if that got two. It's not an act I really want to see on the footy field, especially from my side. So, yeah. What, how, yeah. How, how did you view it? Well, I, I know I only watched uh, – we talked about it last night, actually, before I had watched um, On the Couch or 360, and I didn't realise that it was uh, going to tribunal under serious mi- misconduct. And when there's serious misconduct, it doesn't go under the same rubric as, uh, you know, intentional high-impact medium. Yeah. It doesn't go through those same protocols. Yeah. But when I was under the um, impression that it was under those imp- – uh, protocols I thought uh, intentional um, you know because it wasn't like just a knee-jerk reaction throw the elbow back hoping to get a bit of body accidentally getting it in the jaw buddy mm. style it was sort of a deliberate I'm putting my elbow into his head or neck area held it for I don't know a long two seconds or a short three seconds um, and you know it seemed like a pretty deliberate thing that he was doing and he had time to take the elbow away but he kept it there so I'd say intentional the bloke looked like he was in a lot of discomfort like he had to wriggle his way out so I'd give it medium impact maybe you could argue it's low but if I may I'll go medium and then high so I thought you're looking at three four weeks there I'm not saying that's what I think it should get but I thought under those uh, circumstances, that's what it would get. And then I found out that, uh, yeah, that's you don't go by that rubric and it's more just the tribunal deliber- deliberate and come up with a response. So the AFL 360 boys thought it'd be either a, a large fine or one week, and yeah. then the on-the-couch boys thought it'd be two weeks. So I am actually leaning towards the two-week side, but, hey, I hope for your demons, boys, it's only a fine. Yeah, I can live comfortably with both those. Um, yeah, I think it was a terrible look. The the thing that I felt gave him a little bit of an out, because I've never seen Jack Viney do that on the football field before, was the fracker with Sam Collins and the way it's like the uh, the way it sort of panned out. The I'm trying to think of an MMA word um, that they use. I can't think of it, but it, it was a big tackle by Viney. And then Sam Collins grabs his jumper and pulls him in. So it wasn't like... And that's what I was sort of uh, quite perplexed at last night, was it wasn't like Sam Collins had his arms out like Drew Petrie against Brian Lake, sort of surrendering, going, nah, don't want to borrow this. He was pulling Viney in (laughs) to a point where he was sort of engaging in it. Still, I think the... The elbow out to the head was a horrible look, and I could cop. I could live with two weeks if he does get it. Um, but yeah, it, it was a terrible act. But it, 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 yeah, it isn't condoned for sure. Um, someone who I thought was amazing on that day, though, the D's versus the Suns was Clary Oliver again. Week in, week out, he's getting thirty fives, and a big knock on him has been his kicking. His disposal over his career has been below average, but also his lack of kicking. And I felt like after his first two years, he sort of kicked more. And it was quite funny. It was like, oh, here's a young kid who handles a lot. Why doesn't he kick? And then he started yep. to kick and everyone was like, he can't kick for shit. He's shit. <laughs> and now I feel like this season he's put it together in a complete package. His field kicking has been, he's still inconsistent. He can mung a few when he does the off the back foot one steppers. But when he really puts his body through it, he has been nailing them. And I feel like he's turned into a fully complete player and he's the person that teams tag every week. It's not necessarily Petrarca, it's Oliver um, who gets the tag from the Ds. He gets 35s, 40s every week. He's at the top of the coaches association votes, seven votes clear of the bond. What a performance and what a season he's having. Yeah, I need to accept that he is one of the elite of the elite in the competition because for so long I thought he was an A-grade footballer, A-plus grade footballer, um, you know, top top 20 stuff. But, you know, when we talk about 
oh, the elite of the elite. When, it, when you know, you just go, name the best players you've ever seen and people automatically go, Judd, Ablett, Franklin. I didn't have him in that category for the current playing mob, if that makes sense. Yeah. I didn't have him in the, yep, yeah, Bontempelli, you know, Franklin, that sort of, that sort of rarefied air. Um, but now I think I have to. Like, you know, he's on top of the coaches' votes for a reason. I don't know why. Why do you reckon that is that the footy public probably haven't seen him in the same light as a Bontempelli or a 20... 20- 19 Patrick Cripps Because I feel like He doesn't have that Same aura about him Do you agree? Yeah I agree with that Especially when you ask Like if I asked All my mates Name the top five players In the league He wouldn't be said And he's been In and around that Since his debut Like he has been Super consistent Since his debut And I think every year it, it, you know, His birthday would come around And Swamp would put on Twitter um, The 19 year old To have the most contested possessions And he would just beat um, Paddy Cripps, who had just beaten like the previous record, and he sort of ran down each of Paddy Cripps's uh, records for age and games played. And since then, he's just be- he's he's arguably the best contested ball AFL player potentially ever, and that yeah. is absolutely crazy. And now he's doing it on the outside. He, he's got power through the legs um, out of the contest, and he's kicking a lot better. And that's something we saw Track do last year. So he's He's like a bit of a Brownlow sleeper, which is f- a funny thing to say. But he's he'll he'll be right up there for it. Um, well, he he's in the top four, and with the thing with the Brownlow, you know, just because Pontempelli is two dollars or two fifty, whatever he is, it, it means he's far from a certainty. They've we've had bookies pay out on Chris Judd, Dane Swan one, then they paid out on Dane Swan, Chris Judd one. No one had Prudis anywhere near the near the favoritism. So you know, it, anyone in that top five or six could easily bob up and win that Brownlow. So yeah, Oliver will be right there. Uh, uh, there or thereabouts, just got to hope Petrarca doesn't pull too many votes away from him. Dossie, we're starting to run out of time a bit, so I reckon we should just race through everyone's favourite segment, the GBOs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll fire things off with the out on the full, Roggie. Um, just a horrible incident on the weekend, Sunday night, GWS first Port Adelaide. Jacob Hopper copped a full boot to the head from Carl Amon. He was going for the smother. Um, Carl Amon was going to kick the ball and he's just smacked him straight on the forehead. Hopper was down. One of the toughest blokes in the uh, competition. His head is as hard as a cat's. So he um, he will be okay, but it was a horrible act to see. And I just wish Jacob Hopper all the best. Absolutely. Uh, my out on the full, we've, we absolutely berated them at the start and I'm going to berate them again. <laughs> Not turning up for the milestone games. I couldn't have felt any more embarrassed for when Shannon Hearn's getting chaired off in his big 350 and he just looked like a shell of a man. He looked embarrassed to be sitting up on that perch because they just got absolutely creamed by a bottom four side. So um, the players should feel a lot of shame from that and hopefully uh, that is the loss and the embarrassment and the shame that drives them to be consistent for the last three, four, five, six weeks of football. Yeah, for sure. He he simply did not want to be there. And it's such a shame for someone who's done so much for that football club. I'll move on to my behinds. And this is a glass half full behind. This is a kick a point like to it. kick a point to win the game behind. Really crucial point. Um Zach Guthrie was unbelievable on the weekend. Yes. I'm not talking about Cam. I'm talking about Zach. He had 28 disposals, six intercept possessions. He looks like a man now. He's finally built himself up to look like an AFL footballer. And I don't think there's any harm in being on the Geelong list for four or five years and developing in the VFL. I, I know a Charlie Constable, and we've said this before, and I do feel like he should be playing senior football. He gets 50 touches a week in the VFL. What else can you do to knock down the door? But there's no, it's not detrimental to your AFL career wasting away at the, uh, the Geelong VFL because you can be a good AFL player. You can get AFL ready in that system, I believe. So uh, a fair play to Zach Guthrie, who has been much maligned, especially from their own supporters. Um, but yeah, what a, what, a, what a game. We love seeing uh, players who are knocked by the footy community prove everyone wrong. I don't think there's a lot better sight in football. Paddy Dow's another one. Uh, my behind is the salary cap and salary cap squeezes. Um the reason why it's my buy behind is because it makes a lot of sense to have salary caps. You know, you don't just want to have the olden days where Carlton and Collingwood would win every premiership because we had all the money and we could buy all the players. Meanwhile, Fitzroy couldn't get a bloody kick. 
Um, <laughs> but where it gets, where I don't like it is that, and I'm not the first person to talk talk about it like this, but there we have such champions in our game that deserve to be on massive money, like. You know, yeah. a, a, a Bontempelli or people who are just genuinely Dustin Martin who just win games of football for your side, they shouldn't be on, you know, double what a Lockie Plowman's on. They should be on five, ten times what <laughs> Lockie Plowman's on. So, I don't, you know, and it causes a squeeze because Martin's there going, well, you know, I'm not saying Martin specifically, but say a player of that calibre, well, I should probably deserve $1.2 million considering I win every game of football off my own boot. And then because your salary cap's so small, it means you've got to, sometimes you've got to sacrifice fringe players and you don't want to lose some of your better fringe players, you know what I mean? Um, or, or alternatively, you lose your gun to keep your fringe players. And I just hate juggling all those balls. I would like <laughs> to see maybe a system where you have your salary cap but you have an extra little kitty for like your superstar cap. Like maybe you can nominate three players at the start of the season who get paid outside that cap um, and they can earn the big bucks. That way you're not putting pressure on all your fringe players um, to, to try and fit them all in. Yeah, I like it. I like it for sure. Especially when the TV rights and whatnot are worth billions of dollars in the AFL. Um, I feel like the players should get a little bit more of a lick of the ice cream. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to go into the goals, Rogi. I had a couple written down, but I'll go with one. This week, it is the Saints versus the Swans. It is the Pride game. Uh, The Sydney Footy Club brought out their Pride Guernsey, and I just think it's an absolute unbelievable idea. You just have to have one quick look at through the comments, and there's people saying, don't bring politics into footy, don't... And they're just very negative, and they're negative for a reason, and we don't need to go into that but I just think if there's anyone out there who is um, from the LGBTQTI community who loves football and is a little bit apprehensive to come to the football because of how manly and how you know um, how, how it is just footy culture footy, uh, of foot, old footy culture of old for sure I feel like having a game which says look no anyone's welcome to come to the footy Anyone, anyone from any background is welcome to come to the footy, I think is an unbelievable thing. So um, looking forward uh, to that contest for sure. I think the look no further if you're looking for the importance of the Pride game is just the fact that we're yet to have a player come out as openly gay, you know, not feeling comfortable enough to do so for whatever reason. Yep. And I think while that remains sort of, I'm not saying it is an issue, there it might not be an issue at all. The players might just simply not want to come out and that they're happier that way. But I think it's, uh, you know, there, there have been so many players playing the league that just by pure statistic, there had to have been some gay players running around. Uh, so I think we need to create an environment where it's comfortable enough for everyone to know um, if someone's gay and it doesn't really matter at all. So I, I do love the concept of the pride game and making everyone feel as welcome as po- they possibly can be. And my goal is, uh, once again, I think we've brought it up a couple times this year, but just Gillen McLaughlin and the AFL. It was absolute turmoil on Saturday when Queensland got put into a snap lockdown. They've had to move games all over the shop, refix your Sunday, so we have a frenzy on Sunday. <laughs> and um, I just... You know, there's a lot of things in this world I think I could do. I look at uh, some stand-up comedians up on the stage or the actors in Hollywood and I think, oh, I could, you know what, I could do that one day if I really put my <laughs> mind to it. I've watched the Olympics sometimes and I go, I look at the fencing and I go, I could, <laughs> if I dedicated my life to fencing, I could win gold. Uh, but I look at what Gillen McLaughlin's doing at the AFL and how he's repositioning all the games to accommodate every single team uh, for every single round of the season and I think I could never in a million years do that. So congratulations. Congratulations, Gillen. We're only a couple or three rounds away from the end of the season and you can breathe a sigh of relief. Well done uh, and you're a better man than I. And well done to all the clubs and all the players for being enthusiastic. I think it's probably easy to complain and sook, um, especially when you're away from home, but especially when, you know, the D's flew up on a flight just to come back home. Some teams and some players and some clubs might uh, sook and moan about that, but from Melbourne to Gold Coast to GWS who have been away from home, you're not hearing a peep of frustration from them they're just willing to get the game on so I think it's unbelievable Gillen said last year before we wrap up um, that footy finds a way and in that press conference when the world was just in an absolute state and a half and um, footy's gone for 12 weeks and Gillen McLaughlin comes out and goes nah we'll get a season footy finds a way I 
that rallied me. That got me so inspired and so excited. And since then, he's proven that time and time again. And, um, yeah, footy finds a way, folks. Footy finds a way. I, I think he'll <laughs> go down as the greatest AFL CEO of all time, in my opinion. 100%. Rog, I think that's it for another episode of the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Another great show, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Um, We appreciate everyone watching. We appreciate everyone listening. Thank you again, Connor. And uh, we'll see you all very, very soon for another episode. Cheers. Keep plugging those back pockets. I nearly forgot.